Electric and plug-in hybrid vehicles are normally pretty easy to spot. They're usually small, standalone models that are starting to look a little bit futuristic. Things like the BMW i3 and Nissan Leaf are good examples. What they are not normally, however, is big SUVs that are just as comfortable in the mud as they are around town, like the Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, or PHEV for short. Now, even though this car looks pretty much exactly the same as the standard Outlander from the outside and by and large on the inside, there's actually two different power sources underneath. There is an electric motor, which will promise to run this car for about 30 miles on a charge alone. And then there is a petrol engine, which kicks in when the electricity runs out. Now, one of the big advantages of running an electric car is the noise, or rather the lack of it. And if you listen, PHEV is wonderfully hushed, especially when it's running on electric power alone. Now, there is a little bit more noise when the petrol engine kicks in, but to be honest, you'll be very hard pushed to notice it, and you only really do so when you're properly putting your foot down and overtaking. One of the other benefits that you often hear about with electric cars is that instant sort of kick of acceleration that you get when you put your foot down. Unfortunately, that's not something you get with this car, but to be honest, that'd be a little bit weird if you did. I mean, this is a quite high riding SUV and if it performed like a well, performance car, then that would be a little bit strange. So in many ways, this car driving pretty much like the normal diesel Outlander is no bad thing. And it handles much the same as well. Although because the batteries sit quite low down in this car, it does give a little bit more stability when you're going around corners. In fact, the things that make it feel most like you're in an electric car are these paddles behind the steering wheel. Now, normally those are, in most other cars, used for changing gear, but in this car, you actually alter the level of brake regeneration that you get. So if you pull on this side, then every time you lift your foot off the throttle, then it does loads of braking for you. So actually, when you're around town, you barely need to touch the brake pedal at all. If you're going down the motorway, then you probably don't want that quite so much, so you can take it all the way off, so it's just like an ordinary car. The seating position in the Outlander is really good. You're sat very high up, it's easy to get in and out, and everything, wheel and seat, has got lots of adjustment. Also, because of this high seating position, you've got fantastic visibility all round, front and back. But the biggest problem with this cabin is this middle section here, really. It just looks and feels really cheap, and really quite dated, especially for a car of this class. All the materials just feel a bit flimsy, and nothing's got that feeling of quality you'd hope for from a car like this. Now, the main controls, to be fair, are actually pretty simple to use. Things like the temperature and climate control are all set out very simply here. But it is a bit odd that some of the other controls are tucked away over here. So you've got two separate places you've got to look at. But the biggest culprit is this screen. It's an aftermarket unit. It's clearly not properly integrated into the dash, and it's just really, really fiddly. These buttons on the touch screen are really small, and you've got to be very accurate with your stabbing motions, and the chances are you will, on several occasions, end up pressing the wrong button. Now what with the petrol engine up front and the batteries, there is quite a bit of stuff to fit into the Outlander and you expect that something has to give practicality wise. The Volvo V60 plug-in hybrid, for example, has a boot that is 125 litres smaller than the diesel equivalent. However, that is not the case with the Outlander. This boot is pretty much exactly the same size as that on the diesel version. The only thing is you can't get a seven seat version of this car, whereas you can with the diesel. The other difference is, is under the boot, there isn't a huge amount of storage. There's not many clever bits, but there are a couple of big bins either side. The space in the five seats that you do get is very good though. Headroom is very generous and legroom is fantastic. You get huge amounts of room that way and is this almost totally flat floor. And that means that you can get a third person in the middle with almost no problems whatsoever. Another totally flat thing is the loading bay. There is um, almost no entry lip, and when the seats are all folded flat, it is completely even. However, it's a bit of a problem actually folding the seats because you have to come around to the side, flip the bases up, and then drop the backs. It's not exactly a one-handed movement. 
but how well this car drives, its practicality, etc., won't really matter compared to one thing for a lot of people, and that is how much it costs. And we're quite used to the idea that plug in cars cost a fair bit more than conventional petrols and diesels, etc., but that isn't the case with this car. It costs, like for like, pretty much exactly the same as the equivalent diesel. Once you factor in the government's £5,000 low emission vehicle grant, that is. The only thing you miss out on is that third row of seats and a tiny amount of space in the boot. Running costs should be good as well. That 148 miles per gallon official fuel economy might be a bit of a pipe dream for many people, but if you're doing a lot of miles just around town short journeys, then you'll do many of those on electric alone. The knock-on effect is that it has a tiny CO2 emission figure of just 48 grams per kilometre. That means it's going to be in the lowest company car tax band until at least the end of the decade. And also, you'll get a free tax disc alongside that. And we would say that if you're going to be doing longer journeys, then the diesel is a much more worthwhile car to consider. This car really is, as I say, better for short journeys around town. The PHEV only comes in the top three trims on the Outlander, that's GX3, GX4 and GX5, and all three are very well equipped. All of them get dual zone climate control, Bluetooth and automatic lights, while the GX4 adds some serious luxury kit like electrically adjustable seats and a reversing camera and parking sensors. If you feel the need to go up to GX5, then you also get an electronic tailgate. You can also download an app to your phone that allows you to control when the car charges, see how much battery there is left, and even turn on the heater remotely before you get into the car. Now, with all this technology on offer, though, it is a bit of a shame that you have to go to the top-level trim to get DAB Digital Radio as standard. The Outlander PHEV is a bit of a strange mixture then. It's great in some areas, but it's rubbish in some others. But you can pretty much ignore that really cheap feeling interior, the infotainment system that feels really complicated and a bit naff, and the fact that you can't get a seven seat version of this car because it will be so cheap to run comparatively, especially as a company car. The hybrid Outlander trumps all of its rivals by being no more expensive to buy than the equivalent diesel. Now, bear in mind, it won't fit in with everybody's driving needs, but if it does, this could be a very cheap way to run an SUV. For more information on the Outlander, search for Mitsubishi Outlander on whatcar.com, but before you go anywhere, do click subscribe and keep up to date with all of our latest video road tests.